years uh, was rather in a irritated voice said Wiley Robert B and I walked up and saluted and uh, he said sign here and I said sir I'm I'm qualified as a pilot I said do I have to accept this and he says hell no you don't have to accept it you can go back to the infantry <laughs> and I signed it almost immediately <laughs> and uh, went into navigation training and where did you go for navigation training went to uh, Hondo uh, it's a camp about as I recall about 30 miles west of San Antonio and uh, we studied pilotage and uh, dead reckoning and celestial. And uh, we can, can you go ahead and explain each of those three? Okay, pilotage is very elemental. You're flying along and you have a map and you look at the ground and see where you are. You're over this highway which is here on the map or you you fly past this water tower and it has the name on the water tower uh, and you know where you are. Dead reckoning is you measure uh, your airspeed, uh, you, cal you calculate your true airspeed because you have density as you go up and you have diff so you have to adjust that. You, ha you take your airspeed and your heading and you uh, have an instrument called a drift meter that you look down and you can see how much you are drifting off the course of the aircraft and then you plot it accordingly using, you had a, a picture of an E6B computer. There are really two, well naturally there are two sides of the computer. On one side is a, a plastic disc which turns and which you can write on. So you, uh, you put the drift in there and that will help you calculate your speed uh, and then on the other side we talked earlier I said it's like a circular slide rule and you said many people might not understand a slide rule it's uh, and I don't understand a slide rule but with the E6B if you uh, if you put in your speed and you twist it until you go your distance it's been a long time you put in your airspeed and the distance that you have gone and that will and apply your wind and that will give you the ground speed so that you can do this uh, as long as you can see the ground and uh, you don't have to one thing that people don't really understand celestial navigation in the daytime you only have one source of the celestial body and that's the sun so the only thing you can do is take a shot of the sun and plot it here and then 10 minutes later uh, take another shot of the sun and plot it there and another shot 10 minutes later and plot it there and then move the, uh, the back lines up to the front lines and when, when, they, when those three lines kind of cross that's about where you are now and of course celestial is uh, shooting 
a star here, a star there, and a star here, and getting a line of position from each of the stars and where those lines cross, that's where you are. And I was thinking about this the other day. With the exception of the pilotage, where you can just track it on the ground, if a navigator during World War II was within two miles, he figured he'd done a pretty doggone good job. And now, a 12-year-old kid can hold something in his hand like this, and it'll tell him within two feet of where he is. <laughs> I guess that's what you would call progress. Uh, Navigation is, uh, I have found out, a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. And uh, your mistakes become readily apparent, and then you work hard to correct them. And it goes back to the old adage, uh, you don't have time to do it right, but you always have time to do it over. So. Uh, you learn to, as you get a little more experience, you learn to be and more and more careful in your calculations. By the way, the two mile difference that you were mentioning just a moment ago, that would be using the other term that you used and you didn't define, that would be the drift? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you get uh, practical experience by flying to practice these things? Oh yes, yes. And uh, West Texas in the summertime, and it was summertime down there, has thermal heating that uh, starts with the devil as far as I'm concerned. And we flew in a little twin engine beach where there was a, a pilot and the instructor rode as a co-pilot and then there were as I recall, four students on there. And those thermals bounced you all over the sky. And uh, <laughs> there was a lot of students, including me, who got airsick after about a half an hour of that bouncing around. And our compass was about eight or ten inches in diameter, and there was a cover, a lid, that fit down over the top of that compass, it was about that deep. And that compass cover, uh, in many cases, became a burp bag. And uh, on one of those missions, I was sick as a dog. And the instructor came back and he said, where are we, Wiley? And I said, I don't know. And he said, do you want to wash out of this program? And I said, I don't care. <laughs> All I want to do is die. <laughs> so, uh, but I didn't die. And in September of 44, I graduated as a navigator, second lieutenant. So was that the end of your formal training? Training, yes. Okay. Fine. Not the end of learning, but the end of training, and I'll explain that a little bit to you later on. Okay. You got a short leave, and then it was off to Livermore, no, California? No, we didn't get a short Well, yes, we got a, a leave at graduation and just was able to visit our families and went to Lemoore, California, where they made up the, the crew. And they, they just had it all, uh, all of the pilots were lined up and all the navigators were bombed up, lined up, and all the bombardiers were lined up, and all the gunners were lined up. And they'd say, okay, you, 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 you. And then they take the gunners and say, you and you, you and you, you and you. And that was a 10-man crew. And later on, I, f I figured out something which, uh, as an adult, an older adult, just kind of blew me away. Our co-pilot was 29 years old, 
and we called him Pappy. Our engineer and our tail gunner were each 22 years old. When you average them in with a 10-man crew, the average age on our crew was a little under 20 years old. And you talk about a war being fought by the kids, that's what we were, were kids. Now I, at that time, was 20, but uh, you can tell how young the gunners uh, were and the radio operator and so forth. You mentioned it was a 10-man crew. What kind of a plane had you been assigned to? B-24, which is a four-engine bomber. Uh, most of them were made by uh, Consolidated, I believe, and a lot of them were made by Ford. But I'm I'm not absolutely sure about that. So you begin your now that you've had a crew that's been assigned, you be and you then you begin combat training. Combat now? crew training in Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, they, uh, it, it seemed to me, of course I was a navigator, and it seemed to me like everybody got training except me. I mean, we'd go on gunnery missions and the gunners would fire, or gunnery missions where fighters would make passes and they would uh, they would fire, and the bombardiers would uh, bomb uh, on targets, and we had to cross train. So uh, I, as a navigator, did some training in all of the gunnery positions, including a ball turret gun. <laughs> and I'm six feet tall, and the ball turret is not that big, and that was not very comfortable, but that's the way it is. And uh, I had uh, an opportunity to drop some bombs, and the uh, bombardier showed me how to use the bomb sight, and I was watching and I had the crosshairs right where they should be, and of course the, the bomb sight is tied into the automatic pilot, so whatever the bomb sight says to do, the plane automatically does it. So I thought that the crosshairs were just the tiniest bit off center, so I made the tiniest correction and the, the plane made the tiniest move like this. But of course if you're up at 5,000 feet and <laughs> you you move the release point by about an inch and a half. I missed that target by about a half a mile. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm glad I'm a navigator, not a bombardier. And uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, calibrating airspeed meters and so forth. Uh, I would sit up in the nose and section lines are a mile apart and uh, we would fly, the pilot would fly at a given airspeed and uh, when we crossed one section line I would hit my stopwatch and when we crossed the other and I'd hit it again and then we would compute, I would compute the speed that we had and we would see what his airspeed indicator said and we would make a little chart to adjust it so if uh, his airspeed meter said he was going 155 and uh, I measured it at 156 or 7 they would just put that on a chart so that he could keep it next to the uh, you know keep it in the cockpit and uh, the only real training that I got, they uh, scheduled a celestial mission. And I thought, okay, this is great. 
So we started the celestial mission, which was supposed to be about, I, I don't know, three or four hours. And we had flown for maybe an hour and a half, and the pilot said, Wiley, this is awful boring. He said, uh, why don't you just do follow the pilot? And uh, we're going over here and see Mount so-and-so or Mount so-and-so. Well, you don't argue with the pilot, so that's what I did. And that is the only training I got after I had gotten out of school as far as celestial navigation, which proved to be a little bit interesting later on. But, uh, did, at this point, did you know that you would be going to the Pacific Theater no, we versus had no, Europe? No idea where we were going, uh, and that, that came considerably later. And when we finished our combat crew training, we got on a train and went down to uh, Hamilton Field, California, which is just across San Francisco Bay from San Francisco in, I think, is that Marin County? I, I don't know. Anyway, it's Hamilton Field. And at that time, we were assigned a brand new airplane, a brand new B-24. So the time that we spent there, and I'm not sure exactly uh, these dates, but uh, the time we spent there we spent in shaking down that airplane. We would uh, we calibrated the airspeed uh, meter indicators, and uh, we we flew hour after hour as far as I was concerned. From there up to I think it's Red Bluff, Red Bluff up in Northern California and back at various power settings and various mixture settings and. I didn't have anything to do with this except just to keep track of where we were. The pilots and the engineer were plotting this to see what was the most efficient fuel setting and manifold pressure and uh, revolutions per minute RPM uh, to cruise with. And we did all of this and uh, the, the bombardier uh, checked all of the bomb racks and the releases and uh, so forth to make sure that they were all operable and, and so forth. And uh, then uh, when we left there, we went to uh, Fairfield Suison, which I understand is now Travis Air Force Base outside Sacramento. and. Uh, there we just stayed and waited for orders. And we, you know, we had a lot of time on our hands. We weren't flying, we weren't training, we weren't doing anything. We uh, went into the USO, uh, just had, you know, relaxing time. And uh, I met a girl at the USO that, uh, we had a couple dates, and uh, it was in December, late December, probably about the uh, 22nd or 23rd, 